I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. Royal figures with a high profile due to saturation publicity are people pretending to be state symbols and often go mad in the same way zoo animals can die from being stared at. Princess Alexandria of Bavaria said she'd swallowed a grand piano as a child and believed this until she died. King Ludwig II of Bavaria would swear day was night and night was day, citing a moon he had painted on the ceiling as proof. Prince Otto, his younger brother, decided that the only way to keep his sanity while Ludwig was reigning was to shoot a peasant a day, so he shot them in the garden, then would wonder why his garden was overgrown. Catherine the Great locked up her hairdresser for over three years to stop him spreading the news she had dandruff. Prince Philip of Calabria was infatuated by pairs of gloves, wearing up to sixteen pairs of silk ones at once. King Charles the Sixth of France was convinced he was made of glass, and he'd refused to travel by carriage in case the wheel's vibrations caused his body to shatter into millions of transparent splinters. King Henry Christoph of northern Haiti liked forcing his royal guards to prove their loyalty by marching them off cliff-tops, while Henry executed those who refused. Queen Joanna of Spain went insane when her husband Philip died, and she wouldn't allow him to be buried, but had his coffin accompany her wherever she travelled, caressing his mummified flesh at mealtimes. King Ferdinand II of Sicily would only allow his face to be used on his mail service's postal stamps on condition no franking mark was placed on his image, and all envelopes were handled with gloves. As if inhabiting the same ballpark, the Queen's referred to dark forces at work in this country, of which we know nothing. In London, those who felt British hypocrisy had overreached itself wrote Michael's name on the walls of Buckingham Palace. Michael X, repeated six times, was followed by Michael Abdul Malik. But instead of an X, they added graveyard crosses. In a family photograph, Philip's youngest sister, Sophia, is seen opposite Hitler at Goering's wedding, where every conceivable expression of racist excess would doubtless have been common currency. Prince Philip, who was first known as Battenberg, later anglicized to Mount Batten, in fact, shared the original name schleswig holstein sonderberg glucksberg beck after the family's alma mater, a Prussian principality. But on advice, all these mouthfuls were downsized to the name Windsor, 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 Windsor. Lifted from an English town and an English family, a ruse to deflect prejudice against intrusive Prussian princelings with a passion for large families, and dead animals. Yet anglicizing an irksome past proves only a cosmetic ploy, as in the case of Princess Michael of Kent, formerly Rebnitz, an SS officer's daughter who was heard bawling at African Americans in a New York restaurant, you need to go back to the colonies. Likewise, the Queen's sister, Princess Margaret, who was so royal that she'd sometimes answer the phone with the matchless phrase, this is royalty speaking, as if expecting a long-distance curtsy. Huffley walked out of the film Schindler's List because she thought it was anti-German. It was a tedious film about Jews, she told her butler, and strongly advised him to give it a miss. The princess's views on any races or condition of men that differed from her own were distasteful. She told Chicago's mayor the Irish were pigs, all pigs, and as for India, she hated those little brown people. In Ireland, Dublin's Dean Swift was prompted to despair that... One half of all Irish rents is spent in England and is squeezed out of the blood and vitals of Irish tenants, who all live worse than any English beggar. As Britain increased its appetite for luxuries further, it would extend its foreign possessions. Then, being genteely disdainful of dirtying its hands, it industrialised slavery as a solution. The defenceless and vulnerable were hunted down and rounded up by bribery and terror, sold on to the middlemen who traded in forced labour to produce the empire's new necessities. Royal palaces, paid for with slavery's products, sugar, tobacco, rubber and tea, were built by England's own indentured labourers. King, emperors, would then fill the palaces 
with the acolytes they denobled, and all demanding to be treated like gods. The dark side of the British Empire grew murkier still, thanks to its late Victorian holocausts, in which thirty million died through the engineered famines that lasted twenty years in the Indian subcontinent. Due to the Empire's use of state-backed forced labour, a further four million died in Bengal's famine, thanks to a meanness that was built into imperial policy of refusing food to a feckless poor who'd breed. A free market ideology mixed with colonial callousness would lead to serial megadeaths. There were thousands more victims in Malaya and Africa, in British-owned mines and plantations. Men, women and children had their lives cut short, killed or maimed in the lengthy construction of the Imperial Railways for transporting produce under the armed protection of Imperial troops. The concentration camp was a British invention under Queen Victoria in the Boer War, and in her Indian camps Her Majesty's officers would conduct proto-Nazi experiments. They were to see how few calories Indian coolies needed and still be able to perform hard labour. Such camps rations were less than in Buchenwald, something imperial apologists forget. They forget, too, that their adored icons, such as Churchill, urged Britain to have its empire on the cheap through using aerial bombing, machine guns and poison gas to suppress rebellions and unwelcome protest. I do not understand this squeamishness, Churchill declared, about the use of gas. And elsewhere he'd repeat, I am strongly in favour of using poisoned gas against uncivilised tribes. Thus, poison gas was used on Iraq in the 1920s simply to secure oil for the British Navy, and Sudanese villages were trashed after World War I for objecting to Britain's control of the Nile. In India and the Middle East, every extreme method was used merely to resolve labour disputes or brutally to punish the non-payment of taxes to Britain during Gandhi's non-violent resistance. In the 1920s and early 30s, Mohandas Gandhi was enemy number one to Britain's King Emperor, whom Churchill advised will sooner or later have to be grappled with and finally crushed. It is alarming and also nauseating to see Mr. Gandhi Churchill magniloquently announced, a seditious Middle Temple lawyer, now posing as a fakir of a type well known in the East. Striding half-naked up the steps of the Viceregal Palace, while he is still organising and conducting a defiant campaign of civil disobedience to parley on equal terms with the representative of the King Emperor. Although the Mahatma was the equal of any king emperor. His advice was ignored, and instead, Battenberg, a.k.a. Mount Batten, Prince Philip's uncle, invigilated Indian partition so hurriedly that it resulted in a million deaths, and is still causing more. Then, in pursuit of its post-colonial economic goals, Britain has had direct responsibility for suppressing independence movements in Indonesia, and for the bombing of Yugoslavia, for invading Iraq, yet again, for bombing Afghanistan, yet again, for waging war in Yemen, Egypt and Iran, for supporting state killings in apartheid South Africa, and for backing the invasion of East Timor, for having funded General Pinochet's coup in Chile, and for Great Britain's so-called left, arming the Nigerians in their war against Biafra, solely to protect corporate oil. Worse still, Counterinsurgency troops left England for Southeast Asia and covertly supported U.S. crimes in Vietnam, blessed by royal colonels-in-chief. They then returned with a South Vietnam bar attached to their General Service Medal, though their government was dishonestly denying British troops were ever involved. Yet thus, and most shabbily, with the royal imprimatur, UK lives were sacrificed to American aims, to the U.S.'s Vietnam Holocaust, with its four million dead. The UK monarch fueled a fascist empire in Asia. 
and however you cut it, the Sovereign was Commander-in-Chief of British Army Death Squads roaming Ireland, killing Catholics in collusion with the Ulster Constabulary and killing them with total impunity. Thus, if you factor in the suppression of Mau Mau and the castration of the Kenyan landless, plus the Aden killings of the 1960s and massacres of communist insurgents by the Scots Guards, if you factor in the decapitation of so-called bandits by Royal Marine Commandos in Perak and the bombing of Malaya during the so-called emergency, four centuries of this yields a body count of millions, while the benefit from such imperialist corpse-making has been enriching royal bank accounts. It's added multiple zeros to royal names or to their nominees at Coote's Bank or Rothschilds, or at Bearings. In exchange, royalty swans past, waving with lofty serenity, while it pretends that none of this happened. It promotes its trite fables while covering up financial gain, never apologising for its investment's side effects. During the Raj, in the Punjab city of Amritsar, Britain's local Panjandrum, a Brigadier General Reginald Dyer issued two orders. One ordered all the Indians using the main street to crawl its entire length on their hands and knees, and the other authorised a public whipping for citizens of Amritsar who should find themselves within a lathy length of a British policeman. A protesting crowd gathered in Jallianwalabag, Amritsar's park, on April 13, 1919, where they listened to the testimony of victims, all of them unarmed the and peaceable. To take their anger. Travel to Major. Go in front and... Should we issue a warning, sir? They've had their warning. No meeting. Dyer appeared at the head of a large contingent of British troops. Then, without warning, he ordered his machine gunners to open fire. They pierced two and three bodies at a time. The shooting continued for a quarter of an hour until the ammunition ran out. It killed 379 people, all of them huddling together in fear. General Dyer, is it correct that you ordered your troops to fire at the thickest part of the crowd? That is so. 1,516 casualties with 1,650 bullets. My intention was to inflict a lesson that would have an impact throughout all India. General, did you realize there were children and women in the crowd? I did. But that was irrelevant to the point you were making. That is correct. Could I ask you what provision you made for the wounded? I was ready to help any who applied. General, how does a child shot with a 303 Lee Enfield apply for help? During Indian royal tours, monarchs have been invited by relatives of Amritsar's victims to say sorry. But each time the sovereign's advisers have huffily told them that apologies aren't what monarchy does best. Though eventually, in 1997, by arrangement with the Foreign Office, in an attempt to rebrand the empire as benign, both Her Majesty the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh were persuaded to visit Amritsar's monument. There they would read on its commemorative plaque, this place is saturated with the blood of about 2,000 Hindus, Sikhs and Muslims who were martyred in a non-violent struggle. The Duke, however, harumphed with indignation and turned on his heel as he said, that's a bit exaggerated, it must include the wounded, and implied it was all beneath his notice. Royalty is now 
a dusty cherry on an imperial cake, left stranded as the empires receded, superfluous to requirements, and so stale and tasteless, yet it persists like an unlanced boil in the body politic, a musky legacy of accumulated atrocities, persistently cognizant of the sinister advice of James I's Chancellor. Democracy is the deadliest enemy to a monarchy.